1 John chapter number 3. 1 John 3, while you're turning there, 1 John 3, that song always brings back fond memories every time I hear it. Uh, way back years and years and years ago at the Highland Park Baptist Church, famous Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in the, in the glory days when God was working richly and freely in so many thousands of people's lives, uh, the main church would usually have uh, 5,000 in attendance on a Sunday, Sunday morning only slightly larger than Sunday night. Maybe that's where I developed my favorite service of the week being Sunday night. I don't know, but uh, they had uh, over 50 branch churches in the outlying areas of, of Chattanooga chapels where uh, teams, uh, pastors, men would go out and, and preach in the outlying areas. Then on Sunday night, just after the evening service and as soon as the auditorium cleared somewhat, about nine o'clock, I think it was, they, they had a, a radio broadcast live from the auditorium of the, of the church. Some people would linger and stay after to, to listen to the, to the service. They called it the back home hour the back home hour began nine o'clock and always started with that song turn your eyes upon jesus and uh that every time i hear that well i think it's, it's time for the the back home hour part of the purpose for the the broadcast it was just like a 30-minute service it would have special music and poems and testimonies and and a, a brief uh, challenge from the word just a, a quick 30-minute service it was to enable people that lived and worked in the outlying areas in the chapel churches, the branch churches, as they would be driving home. Uh, they could tune into WDYN and could listen to that service uh, back from the home church. And so uh, songs do a lot for us, don't they? Once they become a part of us and uh, we, we recall the blessing of, of God with connection to certain songs. And thank you, Kendall, for that offertory. We, oh, she didn't, she didn't walk forward to be recognized, I'm sure, but uh, that was embarrassing, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, uh, it's been a while since we've had a, an offertory on the piano, or on the organ, or rather, she did well with that. Appreciate that so much this morning. Now, you got your places in First John chapter 3. Let's begin reading the first verse, 1 John 3 and verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, but he and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And this, in this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. And let's pray, Lord, would you help us as we examine this controversial passage of Scripture? May there be no controversy in your Holy Spirit's administering the truth of God's word this evening or this morning in our midst. And we do thank you for all that is ours in Christ. And would you just manifest your presence in the person of the Spirit of God, work freely in our midst this morning. We'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Uh, verse 4 is our key verse in the passage that we're considering this morning. Uh, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Well, there's much revealed in this brief passage, uh, among other things that are sometimes uh, picked upon in this passage, is uh, the concept of the, the false idea of sinless perfection. And that is the notion that some have espoused. It's not scriptural, it's not a biblical view, and that, that view would be that uh, when a person is, is saved that they, they get to a point, some say instantaneously, and others say that it is a process, but that they could arrive at a point where they no longer commit sin. Now, I would ask you this morning, how many of you have arrived? My hand's down. Okay. I don't mean to embarrass anyone at all. But of course, it's not a biblical view. There is no such thing as a sinless perfection that is taught in, in Scripture. Otherwise, God would just save us and take us straight to heaven, wouldn't he? He leaves us here for a purpose. And we do have bodies of flesh and of sin. Uh, we have what is referred to back in, this, in the same uh, passage. We're talking about the previous chapter. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Three adversaries, three enemies of the believer, of, of the Christian. And we have a lot against us. We have a lot of temptation, a lot of allurements from the world. We have a lot of wickedness surrounding us. And yes, there is sin. We acknowledge that. We, we admit that. But what do you do with this passage that teaches if, that if uh, uh, any man is, is abiding in Christ, he, he doesn't sin, he can't sin? Well, there's a whole lot that can be understood in the verb tenses that are used in this passage. And not to explain away anything, but to further uh, amplify and, and clarify. The, the teaching of, of the scripture uh, if a person is saved we, we do not continue to continually practice sin as master in our life the power of sin is broken the penalty of sin is broken in that we don't have to pay for the eternal price of sin in hell and the power of sin is broken so that we don't have to sin if we decide not to if we depend on Christ to enable us not to we don't have to, to sin and that's simply the teaching of that and a lot could be said in addition to that but that's not basically our message this morning but review Revealed in this brief passage is a declaration, a reminder of the conflict of the ages. And that is the conflict between good and evil. It's always been around longer than we have, hasn't it? There is a conflict between good and evil. Always has been. There currently is. There's a conflict between good and evil. Now, uh, much in our, our society and even in our uh, entertainment has, has been sort of uh, factored around that before. And in fact, some of you that uh, have been into old time television shows and, and cowboys and westerns and everything. I used to like to watch some of those, didn't you? Uh, back when television had some decent things you, you could watch. Not so anymore, by and large, unless you're watching the, the, the reruns. But you could always tell the good guys from the bad guys couldn't you? you? You knew the bad guys were, were wearing black hats, right? And the good guys were wearing white hats. That was kind of the rule of thumb. Uh, back when black and white TV was in existence, that just helped you identify the good guys from the, the bad guys. Now, it's just not that easy anymore because all the lines have been confused and blurred, haven't they? Sometimes the bad guys look like good guys. And sometimes the good guys look like bad guys. It's, it's all scrambled. It's all changed around. But nevertheless, it reminds us of the truth that there is a conflict between good and, and evil. Now, Christians have pretty good a handle on that because God has uh, revealed to us the nature of good and evil, right and wrong, uh, sin and righteousness in, in his word. So it's, it's not that difficult if we'll just follow the guidebook of God's word, the scripture it's, itself. Now, there are two key plagues uh, that are, are revealed in, in the scripture and are two key players rather that are revealed in scripture in this passage it's clearly seen and in all other passages of scripture as well and that is God and, and Satan. Now that would be an, an overall summary of, of good and, and evil. There is God who is good. There is no unrighteousness or darkness that dwells with him whatsoever and there is the devil himself who is absolutely wicked and evil. He was from the beginning as the scripture declares in this passage. And so we have this, this conflict between uh, God and, and the devil, Satan himself. Well, that draws us into the fray. It draws us into the conflict because uh, all humans uh, on earth are either a child of God or a child of Satan. 
child of the devil. That's, that's plain and simple the way it is. There is no in-between. There is no uh, neutral territory. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil, one of other. Now that seems harsh and drastic, but that is exactly what Scripture teaches consistently throughout the Bible. Now I know that uh, we would sometimes object to that uh, Bible truth, but that doesn't change the truth. And I know that we would look at these, uh, these uh, innocent little babies and children and, and wonderful littles, and God bless you, Taylor family that has a special place in their heart to taking care of, of little needy ones through, through foster care. I uh, had a, a little niece uh, that uh, just uh, broke an announcement to our family this week and uh, shot a picture around on these group texts kind of a deal, which I utterly despise. But anyway, I enjoyed getting the picture of a, a little uh, four-month-old baby boy. He has no name. Uh, his mother's a druggie. She's in jail. The baby was never named. Uh, don't know who the father is. Before she went to get jail, she gave him to a friend who's a druggie. And I guess the state stepped in and, and the child uh, ended up in the care of, of my niece and her husband who are uh, just starting up the foster care. And she said the, the little boy's uh, nameless. Uh, he had a, on a, a sleeper and had a, a bottle with dirty water and a dirty diaper, and that's it. Don't know his name, don't know anything about him, nothing whatsoever, and, and there he is. Now, our hearts were stirred at that picture, as yours have been from my description. Our hearts were stirred by the infants and the babies recently killed in a vicious gas attack, and we don't know who did it or what that's all about, uh, but our hearts are stirred to think of the innocence of little ones, but did you know they're not innocent? They're not innocent. They've never learned to practice and be deceivers and, and great sinners. But if you give them time, they will. They will. They'll just be like everybody else in the world because sinners uh, are by nature born into this earth as standard equipment. That's just the way uh, that they are. So we object to that truth and we say, oh, how sweet and how innocent. Well, they're just inexperienced. They're just inexperienced. They're just like your kids. You think they're sweet and precious when they're born. But, you know, it's amazing that, that no parent ever has to go, uh, has to take classes to teach their child how to lie and to misbehave and, and to uh, be a deceiver and, and to be a wicked sinner. You don't have to teach them that, do you? Where does it come from? It just comes from within. It's just born into them. It comes from their, their father, the devil. You say, that's, that's harsh language for speaking in old babies. Well, that is simply an outgrowth of the fallen human nature that came through the original sin of our great, 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 great grandpappy Adam and everyone else who has followed in his bloodline. So we enter this world as, as sinners, as children of the devil, of Satan, and left to our own devices. That's exactly the way things will continue. However, God has offered the free gift of, of salvation to all that will come to him by faith and receive that. And so we're going to, to look at uh, two things. First of all, how to become a child of God. Now, since all people naturally born are children of Satan, children of the devil in their, in their unregenerate condition, how do you become the child of God? Now, in our passage that we read from 1 John 3, uh, chapter 3 assumes that those to whom uh, John the Beloved is addressing are, are believers. He uses that word uh, beloved, beloved. He's, he's speaking as to those that have received the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been regenerated. They've been born again. They've been forgiven of their sins in Christ Jesus. And so he's addressing this to them. So the assumption is in this passage, uh, dealing with sin with others, the things that he's talking about later is that he's dealing with with Christians. But how do you become a child of God? Now, naturally speaking, you're not, but you may become, you may become a child of God. Now, there is a generic sense, and some of it is, is reflected in our in our uh, hymnology, and uh, some of you are, are, are into hymnology and you, you pay attention to the words that you sing occasionally. Sometimes we even sing songs that are not, they're not right. Uh, they don't reflect biblical truth. Uh, but we can, we can sing songs about uh, God being the, uh, the father of all. 
the father of all. He's the heavenly father of, of everyone. Well, he's not, unless you're talking about in a creative sense. Now, in a creative sense, God's the father of everything because he is the originator, the creator of all that, that exists. So in a, a limited physical sense, uh, we, we can sing, this is my father's world. There's a lot of things haywire in this world. Did you know that? We saw some of them this week, didn't we? And maybe we're getting ready to see some more. Maybe a whole lot more. If time goes on, we will see a lot of things that are absolutely haywire. They're out of control. And then we sing, this is my father's world. Well, it's his by creation, but it was surrendered. It was surrendered by the original uh, custodians of the world, and it went into the hands. It was given into the hands of Satan himself. And he now is referred to scripturally as the God of this world. Did you know that? Did you know that he's referred to as the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air? This is not God's world in a, in a dominion sense, uh, in the sense of, of him uh, being uh, the, the God of, of everyone and, and everything. Uh, this is Satan's world. It's his dominion. It's his domain. Just look around you. Just look at the stuff around you. It's clearly illustrated for us, isn't it? However... You can become a child of God by faith in receiving uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, his free offer of forgiveness for sin and inclusion in his family and God's family. So a child of the devil, a child of Satan, a natural born inhabitant of, of this world, uh, sinful in his existence, can trust God's way of salvation, of redemption, and become a child of God. Now this morning I would suspect that many in this room have already done that. Uh, you, you're fully aware of that. You know when the transaction was completed, perhaps. And you say, yes, my faith and my hope and my trust is in Jesus Christ and Him alone. I have no uh, plea before God apart from that of Jesus Christ. Uh, you're saved. You're born again. You're trusting Him fully. Well, you're a child of God, as the Bible uh, describes, not because I said so, but because you, by faith, have received the free offer of the salvation that God has, has offered you. Uh, that's becoming a child of God. Now, what if you don't do that? Well, you continue to be a child of Satan, a child of the devil, and you go on, and, and hell is, is literally being populated by the hundreds and, and uh, thousands of people daily who have failed or refused to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it gets us into a, a bit of an uncomfortable discussion, and maybe we should just sidestep into that discussion right now. What about those that have never heard? Do they still die and go to hell? The answer is yes, they do. Yes, they do. For lack of knowledge, for not hearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say uh, a righteous and loving God would never do that. Uh, we're not going to blame God for sin, are we? And when God offers the free gift of salvation, he includes us in the process of getting the good news out. So if we we're going to blame someone for someone winding up in hell, maybe we would share that responsibility and say, you know what, I've never done my part. Not even to my neighbors, not even to those in our city, in our community. And so I am to fault. I am to blame in part for those who have never heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's why we're involved in worldwide missions in supporting people that can go in places where we can't go, but they can. And carry the message of the good news of the gospel to those lost and needy and undone folks. So in answer to your question, uh, do, do people die and go to hell even if they've not heard? Well, what about those? Uh, that are, are very sincere in their religion. Uh, perhaps they're very sincere in, in, in their false religion, the religion that places hope in something, someone other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, doesn't God take that in consideration? Uh, well, why did Jesus say in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's an exclusive way, and it's Jesus Christ. He's the only way. There are no exceptions. Uh, there are no grandfathering in clauses. And so the gospel of Christ is the only way to become a child of, of God. And we know there are a lot of sincere people. I wish that there were Christians in our church that were as sincere 
as some of the misguided religious people of the world in false religions. Uh, some of them have admirable traits in their stick to and just uh, perpetrating their false doctrines and false ideas. I, I wish that Christians could be just as energetic and enthusiastic about getting the truth into the hands of people that desperately need it. How to become a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. You may be asking yourself the question, can I really do that? And the answer is yes, you may. You can today. Um, you can be born into the family of God by the Spirit of God. You can become a, a child of, of God. And then a second thing we would like to discuss from this passage, uh, not only how do you become a child of God, but how do you act like a child of God? How do you behave yourself as a child of God. Well, verse 6 has the key to that. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, this gets us down to a discussion of the word sin. Sin. What is sin? Verse 4 says that sin is the transgression of the law. Whose law? Well, God's law. Now, we may think that that's limited to the Decalogue, to Ten Commandments, but it's not. It's speaking of the whole law of God, and those who break the law of God are sinners. I would remind you that the law of God at the large glance has more than 600 uh, constituent parts in the law of God. Some of them are very uh, mi minute and detailed and laborious even into the reading and understanding of them. And yet this is the law of God that has been established. And if man does not meet that, he's a sinner. Now that includes originally all of us under sin. But after we become a child of God, then how do we act like a a child of God? Well, by abiding in Him and stopping sinning. There's a tremendous de-emphasis on preaching on sin today because it's not convenient. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that it's, it's not convenient to talk about things that, that go across the grain of people? And in fact, if you have a a mega church of, of some kind or a church of any kind and, and you're trying to encourage people to support the ministry of the church and and to, to, to give and invest in, in God's work. Uh, there's sometimes a subtle temptation not to step off into areas of dealing with sin because someone might get offended and they might quit giving. Uh, but wouldn't it do us good to, to observe what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I think that verse would be very appropriate for church work and, and uh, evangelism and, and everything else, so we don't have to walk a tight wire and be afraid of offending someone and wonder uh, what's going to happen. But it would be good for us to preach the whole counsel of God, the whole truth of God's word, and declare what, what sin is. We have become very very tolerant of sin in our society and even in our churches. Did you know that? Did you know things that were not tolerated because people were afraid of breaking the law of God years ago now have been uh, tolerated? And the key word is tolerance. Tolerance. Oh, you just have to tolerate, you have to be very tolerant of, of different lifestyles and, and different ideas uh, about different things. Uh, you, uh, you just have to embrace and include uh, all of this. And uh, yet, uh, it is a, a Bible truth that is, as we see time progress and go forward, we begin to tolerate a society and even in our churches, a measure of sin and displeasure of, of God. Uh, well, I think there's several reasons for it. Did you know that you can just get worn down and worn out? Did you know that? Sometimes you, you just go and you preach and you give and you go and you say, I'm, I'm just, I'm tired, I'm worn out. I'm tired of seeing the, uh, the Word of God uh, denied and ignored and, and so forth. And so we see a, a general trend. And I, I thank God that there is, is a preserved quality of, of Bible preaching in our church where I trust that you're going to hear the truth about God's Word and not some candy-coated message to tickle the ears of the hearers and make everyone feel good and keep the offerings up. You know, I like to please people. I do. I had a wonderful time at the Sunday school picnic yesterday. And some of you think, why, why in the world would this crazy pastor get on that silly little 
little go-kart and ride those kids around all over the property and, and bounce and have, has, well, I, I just enjoy God's work. I enjoy people. I enjoy having a, a good time. Uh, I really, really, really do enjoy the, the ministry. There are some things that I would rather not do. I'd rather not deal with uh, problems of immorality, problems of sin, problems of, of drunkenness, uh, problems with, uh, with wrong actions uh, in the church. Those, those are difficult things to deal with. And it's, it's easy to have the good times and yet to be worn down when it comes to approaching the truth of God's word. So how is it that a Christian can act like a child of God? And might I say that acting like a child of God would be essentially to be like God to be like him, old to be like him, blessed redeemer. We can, uh, we can be like him. I was thinking in terms of, of the commandments. Did you know it's interesting that even the Ten Commandments, the, the Decalogue, it's just a summary form of, of the larger uh, volume of, of God's commandments. There's part of that that is uh, toward God, and there's part of it that is toward others, toward, toward men. It's about half and half in what we see in the Ten Commandments. It's part our attitude toward God and part our attitude toward others. Now, if we get the God part right, it'll be easy for the others part, won't it? And uh, when, we, when we get those things right. Well, God will give us renewed strength and, and grace uh, to, to fulfill uh, that which he de demands and requires, expects of, of us so that we don't continue to practice, to commit on a regular basis sin. Now, I thank God that when the time comes and we do sin, chapter 1 of 1 John uh, has the relief, the remedy, the solution. If we confess our sins, this is for believers, remember, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is a remedy. Uh, there is a cleansing. There is a confession, a forsaking of sin that enables us to receive forgiveness at the hand of our Heavenly Father who is ours as, as believers. How to act like a child of, of God. Well, I received uh, some rebuke from uh, from my father, perhaps as a young child, and he said, well, you're just, you're just acting like the devil. Well, he was right. Because we either act like our Heavenly Father, and if we're really saved, sometimes we can still act like someone that's not our father, can't we? Uh, wouldn't you think it's about time that God's children, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, would begin acting like children of God? Now, my son-in-law, uh, Rob Mitchell, is here, and his dad had a saying, I know enough about this. And uh, his dad would say, no, son, because Mitchells don't act that way. Now, there's some wisdom in that. And you say, well, that's, that's proud. No, that's good training. So Christians don't act that way. Now, you don't become a Christian by being good, but you act like a Christian because you are a child of God. And Christians act certain ways. You say, well, are you the authority on that? No, I'm not. No, I'm not a fall for, far short of that. But God is. And he, he outlines in his word how that we should live our relationship toward others, our relationship toward him. So we see some interesting things in 1 John chapter 3. And we see how to become a child of God. And we see how to act like a child of God. Would you let the Holy Spirit of God deal in your heart concerning this matter of, of sin? Now, I know that the tendency, uh, the, the bad tendency is for us to perhaps engage in evangelistic outreach, distributing our Ron, John and Romans and, and dealing with people and winning people to the Lord Jesus. And we say, thank God they got saved. They don't have to go to, to hell. Now they can go to heaven. And we had uh, uh, 53 saved during the war, special forces and so forth. Uh, praise the Lord. We're happy for that. But, you know, that's just entry level. That's beginners. Then there's more. And there's more for some of us to have been sitting around this church for 153 years, too. There's Max number again. <laughs> there's more for us that have been around here for a long time, too. There needs to be a keen sense of awareness of the presence of God and pleasing a holy God and knowing what he wants rather than what the flesh wants. And that's how we would act like a child of God rather than the child of, of, of Satan. Are you saved? 
Are you saved? Act like it. Live like it. Many of you do. Many of you uh, consciously in a dedicated way attempt to live uh, a life pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that the flesh could rear its ugly head and say, well, nobody's going to tell me how to live. Nobody's going to tell me how to live. Uh, well, God already has. And that's the standard. And we ought to fall into line with the expectations of our loving Heavenly Father who gave himself for us and made us his very own beloved children in his divine family. So if you're here this morning, if you've never been saved, you can come and trust the Lord Jesus this morning. You can stop being a child of Satan and become a child of God today with all the heavenly eternal benefits of that. If you are saved... How about acting like a child of God on a consistent and a growing and a developing way? I would not cast any uh, stones at any individual whatsoever rather than giving the truth of God's word this morning. Are you a child of God? Uh, live like it as a loving Heavenly Father would have us to do. Heads are about eyes are closed as we close this morning.